How's it going, YouTube? Stocks by the Numbers here. Welcome back. Monday, fresh week here, May 15th, as per request in the special request channel in the Discord. Someone asked to check out BTG, which is a uh, mineral, precious metal, gold company. So let's get into it. Now, first of all, one of the things that bothers a lot of people and could be very frustrating is that this is now a situation where you will see appreciation and you will see growth in your investment, but of course, it's really directly tied to the price of gold, right? So this falls into the category of um, like a Mara, M-A-R-A, or like a Riot blockchain, right? R-I-O-T. And these companies, those two examples I just gave, you know, they have a lot of Bitcoin. So basically, you know, if Bitcoin popped today, 3 4%, that's when you see those stocks pop 8 11, 14%, right? So it moves with the underlying asset. And that's what we're seeing here, basically, even throughout the years. Now, of course, the company has been doing some good things, right? Let, let, let me go over just some of, the, uh, some of the generals real quick. So, BTG. Stock right now, $4.16, up 5 cents, about 1 and a quarter percent. As we see here, we're near the top of the range and near the higher end of the 52-week range. As we see here, 52-week high, 440. Stock right now, 416. However, we're seeing a market cap here of, we'll call it 5.3 billion. Uh, they're yielding about 4% for you to own the stock. It's always nice to have a dividend. Company's trading about 17 times earnings, and they're earning about 24 cents a share. Now, Looking at these EPS estimates, we can see they have missed on the EPS side three of the last four quarters. And even coming down here, we can see annually we had very, very big drum, big jumps here as the economy was getting more and more rough throughout the years. And then, of course, we had uh, the 2020 situation, which brought gold, silver up in value. So, of course, this company was going to be making more money per ounce of gold. And as we see here, revenue was just sub 1 billion, and then it jumps up to about 1.2, then it jumps up to almost 1.9. However, since these heights, as we see here, look at the profit margin too, note that 35%, the company has been doing some good things on their balance sheet. However, the revenue has since been slipping slightly, going from 188 billion down to 175, now as of last year, 166. So revenue is slightly slipping. However, they are remaining net income positive, and we can see here for the year of 22, profit margin a little over 14.5%. If we switch over quarterly, though, you can see a little bit more of sporadic movement here. You can see for about three quarters in a row, they basically maintained that $370 million mark. However, profit margins were taking a hit, as we see here, north of 22%, down to sub-10, down to negative. Then, of course, we had a nice pop here, Q4 of 22, coming in with almost $600 million in revenue, and, of course, jumping back, net income positive, north of 26%. And this is last quarter that was posted, $473 million in revenue, net income positive, profit margin, 18%. So if we come in and we look at this earnings report, we can see that they came in above estimates on the EPS side, and as well as almost a 9.5% beat there on the revenue side which sounds pretty good, right? So as of right now, the company does look pretty decent. However, if we back up a couple of quarters, we can see healthy revenue coming in, missed on the EPS side, miss on the top and bottom lines, miss on the top and bottom lines, just a beat there on the EPS side, just a beat there on the revenue side, miss on the top and bottom lines. So th this is what I always talk about, right? If this company was consistently coming in with these beats, uh, even if analysts lowered uh, expectations, whether it was how many ounces were going to be mined or the value per ounce for gold, right? If the company was able to maintain uh, the EPS numbers above these estimates and, of course, at least meet or beat revenue consistently, then, of course, we would be talking about a much, much different situation here. However, you know, company, again, a little sporadic. And you can see even when you back out like this, right, you can see, look, this is uh, this orange line right here is gold. So I brought up the actual value of gold over the years, and I'm now comparing it 
to the stock that I'm looking at, BTG, right? So as we see here, boom, gold came down, took a hit. This is a uh, pandemic era right here, May 2020. The stock comes down, bounces off the bottoms with gold, right? As gold was running, remember, during this time frame, they were printing money hand over fist. And if you go back, you look at the charts, even if you look at the uh, silver and gold ETFs like SLD, GLD, all of these uh, ETFs uh, uh, surrounding these precious metals were increasing in value hand over fist because the value of the dollar was going down, so precious metals go up. And as we see here, along with the rally of gold really exploding here coming into uh, July and August, you can see that the stock followed suit and ran all the way up to, uh, what, about seven and a half coming from uh, these lows down here of the threes. And even here with the pandemic, you can see, look at the low up there, 216, right? So the stock was down at $2 and rallies all the way up to seven and a half um, over the course of about six months. That's from March to August, right? And then as you see here, look, the price of gold begins to slip and start selling off, and so does the stock as well. And then it bounces off the bottom, rallies a little bit, and so does the stock. And then it drops down and flattens out for several months. And again, the stock was a little bit more volatile than the actual value of gold because, again, the company was struggling with earnings estimates. And then, of course, gold is rallying up here, March 22, and you can see the stock beginning to gain life. And then we sell off here going into mid-summer of 22, and that's exactly what the stock did. And then gold runs up, stock runs up, gold comes down, stock comes down, gold goes up, stock goes up. So you guys understand what the heck is going on here. And basically, I drew out some of these trend lines here because this is uh, from inception here, as you see, going all the way back to 2011. And I drew this trend line from this first top all the way to the top it hit uh, pandemic. And then I drew the support, of course, across the bottom here. And if we back that out, you can see it's kind of widening, right? It's, it's, it's more of a trumpet than it is a, a wedge. So I had to see what else the chart may possibly be telling us, right? So then what I did here is obviously you can see the tightening here. And of course, it made the perfect uh, symmetrical triangle. And then they broke the stock down before raising it back up. However, anytime you have these patterns, you'll notice, even if you extend beyond the pattern as I did here, right? Because this is our triangle right here. But I extended these trend lines out, right? Because most, because these stocks trade electronically. And they use these trend lines as indicators of resistance and support levels. So, as you see here, drawing along the bottom of these candles, incidentally, it is also right where... Uh, the stock closed that month. This is February and then March, right? So these are month candles. So it closed right there at the trend line. And then you see here on this candle, it went up to the trend line and then resisted, right? And then you can see it fought to get back above this trend line. And look, it closed like right at that trend line. And we extended out. Look, bottom was the trend line. You have a uh, almost a bullish hammer forming, but resisting right there at the trend line. The next candle resisted right at the trend line. And look at the closes here, right at this trend line. And even across at the bottom too as well. You know, it lines up with the uh, with the bottom trend line as well. However, of course, uh, the you know, the stock was going higher over these years, not lower. So this bottom trend line going upward is showing you much more resistance and support than the bottom trend line going downward. However, um, you can see here that multiple lows were hit at this level here. So that's why I just kind of drew this random trend line across here just to catch these bottoms and these support candles. And we can see now that it's kind of diverging into multiple patterns here. So the purple is the high after pandemic and the low of pandemic. And as you see here, we're forming our triangle. This circle right here is the apex for the pandemic purple triangle. And as we see here, Obviously, the price of gold has been rising as of late, and now the stock is bouncing off of this blue trend line and is now kind of meeting up with this top trend line, and now we have a triangle forming as the price of gold is rising. So we may have a potential breakout here going at least up to this FIB level of about 507. It's showing, but technically should really go up to this trend line before potentially rejecting and uh, fluctuating with the price of gold, if you will. However, 
over the years, we can see this is going back to 2016. And even though it has been a rocky ride, and then, of course, you had the big drop and the big spike here pandemic, we could say from this point here, we've basically been in an uptrend, right? Because, again, even though it has been rocky over the years, the company has been growing. And I will also bring up the financials because the debt has actually been decreasing slightly. So the company is acquiring assets, you know, limiting liabilities, trying to pay back their debt. So, you know, again, kind of, a, again, unfortunately, kind of a mixed bag. And um, this is why with me personally, depending on the situation, I'm not bashing this company at all. But, you know, depending on the situation, I would probably just bypass the miners like this and not even invest into these actual stocks. Because if you want to hedge play or if you feel that uh, the value of the dollar may start to slip, so the value of gold and silver may continue to rise, trust me when I tell you, you are potentially better off just buying some uh, long-term calls with uh, you know some decent time on them and just grabbing calls on um, ETFs I mentioned like SLV or GLD, which move in line with the price of gold and silver. And of course, you are not potentially exposed to a sporadic, uncertain company's earnings, right? So this whole time here, right? Look at, look at the way gold has risen. We're, sh we're seeing what here? Basically October of last year. So this is now we're going like seven months straight, right? That the price of gold has been going up. Now, of course, if you got in here, we can say it's at about $3. You know, it went up to, uh, you know, 440, it looks like here. So you made yourself almost 50%. However, in this same time frame here, uh, October, November, if you bought like, yeah, like March, or even like May, June, uh, calls on GLD, chances are you would have made significantly higher returns as opposed to just investing into shares <clears throat> of BTG. But again, that's just my opinion. I know some people like to own the actual companies. Again, they are paying you a dividend to own it. The difference between buying shares and investing into stock options is... Um, you, you're not on that limited time frame, right? You don't need to have the move that you need to happen within the next couple of weeks or a couple of months. You know, you can hold it indefinitely. And if it works out four or five years down the road, you're still a winner. So that is why, yes, it is much cheaper usually to buy options. However, of course, you know, greater risk, greater reward. So that's why you could have seen better percentage gains if you invested into GLD calls long term, however, again, you are on a time frame, and of course, this company is paying you uh, almost four percent just to own shares. So, you know, it really kind of depends on on which way you want to play it. But of course, everyone has their own strategy. But I wanted to look at some of the financials here because, again, just looking at the charts here, we can see the stock is now staying above this uh, twenty-day simple moving average. And again, we're kind of hitting this apex here of a potential triangle inside of a triangle. And um, overall, again, the price of gold has been rising for the last several months. So I do have a feeling technically if we follow these trends that it will most likely break out of this again and uh, climb up to the high fours and potentially five and try to get back here to this trend line as we see here multiple times climbed up and even broke at times above this trend line before coming back down. So it may potentially retest again. But again, you know, it, it does come back to earnings as well. People forget that. You know, it, again, it will rise with the price of gold. However, if the company really begins to shit the bed, it's not going to matter. As we see here, looking at the forecast, you got a one-year price target average of about 565, which again is about 35% higher than where we are now. And if we uh, look at the forecast, we can see 15 analysts over a one-year price target, max estimate of 711, min estimate of 425, right? But more importantly, look at this. 11 of these 15 say they would buy it hands down. Two of them just say it's a buy and they like it. Two of them say to hold it. So this, believe it or not, is actually a really good sign here. When you have all of the analysts coming out saying it's either a buy or a hold, then it's probably worth your attention. So again, chances are these analysts feel 
that the value of gold is going to slowly continue to appreciate as the economy is in the crapper. But again, long term, see, this is what bothers me, bothers me here, looking at these forecasts. First of all, the company has missed on every EPS forecast as we see here going back to 2016, which is not a good sign, and only one beat for annual income here, slightly coming in above estimates here, one out of these seven years going back to 2016. So obviously their track record is kind of dismal. And if we look here at the forecast, we can see, yes, the EPS slowly rises over these years. However, you know, we were up to almost 50, and then even as everything sold off, they came in light here, posting 36, estimates of 38. And now look at the future estimates here. For this year, 23, estimating only 31 cents a share. And then down to 30, up to 36, and then down to 17. So the forecast is that this company not only is going to struggle with profitability, but more importantly, is going to continue to struggle with revenue. And as we see here, the high in 2020, about $1.8 billion, and then has since slightly been pulling back, but now for this year, estimates $1.88 billion, right? So a little bit higher than their high back in 2020, which means potentially that these analysts are estimating, again, that it is going to get more rough here before it gets better, right? Because again, if the dollar goes down and everything gets shitty, that's when gold goes up. This company makes more money, right? They made their most money in 2020 when the shit hit the fan. So if they're going to make a little bit more than they made at the highs in 2020, then that means it might get a little worse before it gets better, right? I'm sure that makes sense. But then you switch over here to 24 and look, estimates pull back to 183. And then 25, 192. So two years later, they're going to do, what's that, $40 million more in revenue than they did in 23 here in 25. And now look in 26, 173. So this is why I'm saying you are potentially better off um, letting them sell off the value of gold and then stepping in on something like a, like a GLD and just riding up the value of gold. And even on the flip side, once they run up the value of gold and potentially get to one of those trend lines we looked at, that is when you can obviously flip the script and go on the other side and say, okay, now they're going to pull you know, gold and silver down, so I'm going to bet on the put side or potentially short the ETFs and then step in and obviously after the sell-off, you you know, so you just keep jumping around back and forth. But I wanted to show you guys the, uh, the forecast there. And if we switch over here to the financials, as we see here again, you know, good growth here it has been slipping the last couple of years. Uh, everything looks pretty positive. Uh, however, again, missing estimates here four years in a row on the EPS side and only beating one of the, out of the last four years on the revenue side. However, the company has begun paying a dividend out here going into 2019 and then bumping it up even more in the last couple of years uh, since said pandemic. So jumping up to uh, 11 cents a share and is now maintaining about 16 cents a share. And as we see here, about a 4% dividend yield from the uh, current value of the stock here. But I wanted to show you guys also, more importantly, look at the debt, how it's been decreasing. The debt here in 2018 was uh, approaching 500 million. And then as we see here over the years, look at that, 261 million, 110 million, 75 million, now 57 million, right? So, so that is a very, very good sign that this is what I'm saying when, again, I know this company is kind of tied to the price of gold, but, you know, if this was a completely different company like a Palantir and we were looking over the years and we said, okay, you know, debt was 500 million and now it's, you know, a couple of hundred million, a hundred million, look at this, sub hundred million, right? That is an excellent, excellent sign. And that, in my opinion, should be these companies' number one priority. However, again, the reason why most of them have debt on their balance sheet is because you need to kind of understand the financial system overall and how money works. And if you talk to people with money, you know, they use their credit to take on more debt because debt is money. And, you know, obviously that's another situation for another video. However, you know, th that is why even the healthiest companies will always have debt on their balance sheet, whether it's for uh, a tax loophole or to potentially just roll those assets into something else. But I do like dividend growth. I do like the decreasing debt. And I love the uh, increasing uh, cash, as we see here, 100 million cash and cash equivalents I'm looking at. 
up to 140. And then look at that jump, almost half a billion. Look at that, 670 million, maintaining 650 million. So the company seems to be doing some positives here. And of course, switching over here, just in the short term, assets are outweighing liabilities about five to one. Well, we'll call it four to one. And then of course, in the long term, that's like an eight to one ratio here. Look at assets, 2.6 billion on liabilities of only 330 million, right? So if you add these up, you have about 3.6 billion in assets and only about 500 million in liabilities. So that's why, again, I, I do know the company has been struggling here over the years on these EPS and revenue estimates. And even the last several quarters is coming in with, you know, rocky, uncertain uh, earnings reports. However, overall, the company does seem to be trending in the right direction here, especially just looking at these fundamentals. We look at the revenue uh, as we see cost of goods sold slowly increasing. However, revenue is outpacing the cost of goods sold, yielding a positive gross profit. And now again, look at the operating expenses. Only a very, very small chunk coming out of the gross profit. And of course, the gross profit minus the operating expenses yields operating income. And as we see here, uh, was at one time sub 100 million and in the low 100 millions and has since jumped up here to almost a billion and maintaining half a billion as of right now showing about 586 million positivity on the operating income. So this is what I'm saying. There are some negatives on the back burner for this company. However, they do seem to be trending in the right direction for a lot, a lot of these fundamentals here. Again, we're seeing assets increasing basically year over year. Liabilities, again, look at this, 880 million was north of a billion, and then since has just been slowly getting chipped away here, 600 million, 700, sub 600 million, now 568 million. <clears throat> Assets increasing, liabilities decreasing, debt decreasing, right? The, the, these are all decent signs here for this company. Book value per share is sitting here at 280 a share, stock right now 417. So not trading at the highest multiple and uh, could give us a little bit of room for growth here. Of course, the uh, cash from operating activities has been slightly decreasing since the height there in the pandemic, and now the cash from investing activities as well is now lower than it was at the height in 2020. Financing activities, however, has been trending in the right direction here. It was as high as minus 280 and has since slightly been climbing back up. And of course, we looked at the free cash flow here, several hundred million dollars, so that's why I'm saying that there are some positives, there are some negatives, but I do know that someone in the Discord asked for um, you know a quick review here. This was one of the symbols they were keeping an eye on. So that's why, again, situation like this, you know, it could work out over the years. You could get completely burned over the years, but that that's why, again, in my opinion, if you are interested in gold or silver, you might just be better off going for SLV or GLD. The PE, as we've seen here uh, back in 2020 at the height, was sub-9. And has since jumped up to 10, 15 and a half. Now it's 17 and a quarter, right? So, again, it has been rising as of late along with the value of gold. And again, the company paying down debt, doing a couple of good things. However, as we see here, this is really the highest PE it's seen since 2018. So that's why a pullback could be coming soon. Price to sales here, uh, just a touch below two and a half. You know, good bounce off the lows here going last year. However, you know, they were in a better situation several years prior. So I don't know if I would really use that as a big uh, buying or selling indicator here. Same thing with the price to cash flow, sitting here at about 6.6 .6 times cash flow. Um, slight decrease from where they were. However, they were significantly higher back in the past. Trading a touch below one and a half times book value. We looked at it before, $2.80 book value. Glad that I came up off these bottoms here. However, again, you can see on average, this is easily like a 1.8, potentially even 1.9 over the years. So again, does have a little bit of room to grow if we look at historical data over the last several years for the price to book ratio. Not the best metric to use though, in my opinion. Enterprise value has made a nice little jump here in the last year, jumping um, north of 33% here from last year, 3.3, now up to 4.63. The problem is the market cap right now is like 5.4 billion, right? So again, the enterprise value, <clears throat> excuse me, the enterprise value is the value that another company would put 
on this stock if they were to buy them out. So technically, you can say another company would value the stock at $4.6 billion. Right now, it's at $5.4 billion, so probably due for a little bit of a sell-off here. The return on assets we looked at have just been, you know, I'm glad that they're making slight bumps here from the drops they had last year. However, you know, was higher back during the pandemic levels, of course. But before that, as we see here, trading around the twos and the low single digits here, now we're in the high single digits. So that's why I'm saying it's very difficult, in my opinion, to really analyze this situation. Because at the end of the day, if gold's going higher, the stock's going to go higher, uh, you know, whether the numbers are healthy or not, because the ounces and the assets that they're holding are now worth more because the value of underlying assets has appreciated, right? The return on equity, again, as we see, climbed up almost 29% and has since been chunking down here, but it has slightly reversed from about 85 back up to about 9%. Return on invested capital, similar story, was sub 8.5, now up to the high 8s. The gross margin percentage has made a nice rebound here, sitting currently north of 45%. And uh, as we see here, minus, what year was this? Minus 2020, of course, at the height, we see 53.5%, very nice. But minus that high, this is the second highest it's been, going all the way back to 2016. So that is a positive metric. On the, on the pro side, not the con side of BTG. The operating margin percentage, we, we looked at these numbers before on the balance sheet. And again, we see here we had a high of almost 50%, dropped down to sub 40, about 30. Now we're back up north of 40. That's an excellent sign. EBITDA, once again, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. As we see here, back almost 61%, going from 52%, which really isn't that low. Again, if we back up, you can see sub-40, mid-40s, but again, at the highs, 66.5%, but somehow they have now brought this back up to 61%. So that's why I'm saying the company does have some really good pros, but again, there are a couple of cons. So not really giving high conviction here, in my opinion, and that's why, again, it, you know, if you, if you forced me to buy or sell a situation like BTG, I will most likely get it incorrectly because the picture is not clear, there are no patterns, um, some of the numbers are attractive, some of them are wishy-washy, and that's why now to force yourself to buy or sell BTG, you are essentially gambling because there is no real definitive direction that this company is going to go in. Uh, net margin percentage, again, was well over 20% and climbed up to 35% at the highs. And we looked at this before. And in the last several years, we can see a pullback sub 24, pullback about 14 and a half. Now, slight reversal here, north of 18%. So that's why some of these numbers are trending in the right direction. But it's just very hard to rely on these mining companies as opposed to just investing into the underlying asset. The inventory turnover, again, how quick they turn over inventory, obviously. As we see here, was slightly climbing over the years here, 385, pulled back to 37, now 374. Asset turnover, once again, just to review this, uh, this is basically, uh, can be used to measure the effectiveness of which company uses assets to generate income. The higher it is, the more efficient the company is, since higher ratios mean that the company generates more income per dollar of assets. And obviously, if it's lower, it's bad. So as we see here, the company, again, jumped up to about 0.62 asset turnover. And you guessed it, that was back in 2020 and has since slightly pulled back. However, recently reversed, going from sub 0.5, now back above 0.5. So that's why I'm saying, again, there are some positives, there are some negatives. I do feel on paper here, looking at these metrics, that the positives are outweighing the negatives. However, again, it will most likely, you know, you, you will most likely either make or lose money here because of the rise or fall in the value of gold. That's all it comes down to. I do like that as times got rough and the company started doing better, that's when they decided to start paying out the shareholders. I think that's a very good sign. Always nice to own a company that's uh, paying you a dividend to own it. But again, these forecasts even really, really rocky. And even if they come in line here 
with these estimates. We can fast forward to 2025, and unless the, the value of gold has skyrocketed, chances are this company could either remain flat or maybe run up to like the high fours, the, the five fib level we looked at, and just kind of remain flat there, right? Because again, revenues are not really exploding. And even if they meet revenues for 23, that'll be a very good year. However, next year they're going down. And then from 25, they're only going to slightly be up from these highs. And then again, look at this massive pullback uh, forecasted for 2026, revenue coming down to 173. So that's why, again, in my opinion, you are much, much better off uh, just simply playing uh, the calls and the puts on your precious metal ETFs like your SLV and your GLD. However, regardless of the wishy-washy numbers and forecasts coming out, again, we looked at the analysts, and out of 15 of them, 13 say buy, strong buy, and two have it as a hold. So, you know, that does look good. However, again, if we go back to our Twilio video, I basically abused all of those analysts because they were, you know, 25, 35, 40% off <clears throat> with their old price targets on Twilio and now with their supposed new adjustments now with the last quarter that was reported. So, you know, that's why you can't really always follow analysts. And it's very nice to see that they all agree that the low, again, they're estimating uh, 425 and the high was up at $7, right? I mean, that that's great. But again, as we saw with Twilio, Sometimes these people have no idea what they're talking about. So don't use that. You have to stay sharp on the actual value of gold, which again, as we see, has been climbing for about the last six, seven months. We do have an apex approaching here. We could have a potential pop out here to about $5 a share. Uh, however, again, we have to keep an eye on these technical patterns to see if it breaks above or below any of these support or resistance levels. We have to keep an eye on this uh, simple moving average to make sure it stays above it. You have to keep an eye on the candles to make sure that there are no um, uh, bearish hammers that are going to reverse the direction of the stock in the technical sense. Uh, however, again, you know, basically climbing slowly and steadily over the years. So if you did want to make this a long-term hold, you know, I do kind of understand it. However... Uh, if you get in here at above four dollars and then they pull it down to like 320 again it's only a dollar however it's a 25 percent drop and and you are really going to feel that negative volatility in the short term before you see some big appreciation down the road over the years in the long term so again kind of an unclear picture but just wanted to cover all bases and um you know regardless of anything i pull up any metric i look at i always want to give you guys my opinion and um of course you know there may be people in the comments section who say this is a screaming buy and it's going to go back to seven there are other people who say they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole some people may disagree with what i'm saying about just investing into the etfs <clears throat> other people may come back and say yeah, investing into the ETFs is a phenomenal idea, and they've made money, you know, hand over fist on these uh, gold and silver rallies here with pandemic and the sell-offs and now the recent rallies here. So, you know, th this is a situation that I feel is just highly politicized because, you know, even if you talk to people who really stay on top of the money supply and the financial system, you know, they will scream at you till they're red in the face saying that gold and silver should technically be significantly worth more than they're currently trading at right now because of the devaluation of the dollar and, of course, uh, the dilution of the dollar because they just consistently keep printing. And, of course, common sense tells you that that really does kind of make sense, right? So, you know, that's why, again, it's, it's, it's hard because... Uh, like, how can I put this? Like, the dollar the dollar is legal tender, even though it is the world reserve currency. But the valuation of gold and silver may not be real and fair valued, quote unquote, because it's valued in uncertain, uh, in uncertain volatile U.S. dollars, right? 
per ounce. So that, that that's why, again, it's a rough situation. And uh, in my opinion, if everything was going well when I was trading stock and stock options, uh, when I was feeling good and I was so much more right than I was wrong, that is when you'll get the, the idea creep into your head that, okay, wait, everything's going great. I have a feeling this could turn on a dime and I could start losing money hand over fist. You know what I should do? I should buy calls on SLV and GLD so that if markets and stocks and our currency does begin to enter a massive bear pattern and begin to pull back significantly, guess what? Gold and silver is going to go up and hopefully the gains that I make on GLD SLV calls is going to outweigh short-term losses that I deal with during this uh, you know, BS volatile time. But I'm going to end it there because, you know, again, we're basically beating a dead horse. There's only so many times I can repeat myself. But I'm sure you guys understand the gist of what's going on. I know one or two people asked about this company. My apologies, I can't give you a firm, concrete direction. But sometimes there just isn't one. And that's why I always say you have to stay sharp. You have to stay disciplined. You have to stay focused. You have to take what the market gives you. And if you force yourself into these trades just because you like it or someone mentioned it on Reddit, you are now gambling and you are not investing and you are not trading. So moving forward, I understand that markets are rocky and volatile and uncertain. So I want to wish everyone success. I hope everyone makes a couple of dollars. I want to thank you guys for stopping by. I'm going to catch you guys in the next video. Take it easy.